thank you, choir. We have victory in Jesus. We can go now. I mean, if we all just, they just told us we have victory. All right. So uh, you're standing for the benediction. No, I'm just, um, no. Um, you're like, we like this service. Uh, we'll be out of here quick. No. Um, thank you for being here with us today. We do. We get to come here in the victory that Jesus has won for us. And isn't that the good news of the gospel, that it isn't up to us in our success and our earning? Uh, there is nothing that hangs in the balance, no question of how we stand before God. All of that has been accomplished through Jesus Christ. And so you and I get to stand here in confidence and in hope of what Christ has done and what will someday be realized for us in his presence, in the coming of his kingdom. So, um, wow, what a great way to, to begin today. I'm Pastor Brady, uh, Pastor April Failer. We're so glad to, to be with you today and to share this hour. If you're a guest with us, thank you for coming. Um, I know it takes a lot to sometimes enter the doors of a place you've never been before, and so we're glad you chose to do that today, and I hope that you're encouraged as we gather here in worship uh, to have our, our faith built and encouraged as we take steps closer to knowing Christ and living the life that he desires that we live in him and the joy that's ours when we do. So with that, let's stand and offer our praises to him. Good morning, and as you stand this morning, we are going to proclaim these words to the Lord. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Join us this morning as we sing. Right. 
godly playtime. Thank you so much for worship, where we can come and listen to your word and hear you speak to us and move in our hearts. May you be with our children. May you be with our church as we continue to offer our praises to you, as we offer ourselves to you, that you might move in incredible ways in us. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. continue to worship this morning, singing these words, my Jesus, I love you. Please stand the affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the same Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and of life everlasting. Amen.
Would you join me in prayer? Almighty God, what joy there is in your sanctuary when we come to offer you our praise. In the words of Psalm 150, we gather here to offer you praise for your great deeds in our life. We come to offer you praise for your royal and faithful love that you continue to pour out upon us, a love that defines us and shapes who we are. We thank you that the life that we live in you is but an expression of what you have already done in us and among us. That we do not come here with a sense of earning. We come here with a sense of rejoicing because of your faithfulness. Because you've accomplished everything you set out to do to bring us new life through your son, Jesus. And so what we give here in this moment, which it symbolizes a gift far greater than anything monetary in the offering of ourselves, is but a response to your love and what you have done. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Reassure us, Lord. Allow us to know your presence in ways that we've never imagined possible. Allow us to read the word and know you better. Allow our hearts to be open and our ears and our eyes open so that we can fully receive all the grace and mercy that you have to offer to us. Lord, we know that you are a perfect giver. You've showed us what sacrificial love really is. And yet our reception, our ability to receive you 
It's not perfect, not by a long shot. Help us to be in a place where we can find and plant our feet in our faith and recognize that you are the Almighty. You are the magnificent. You are all that we have read about and more. We experience you in different ways, Lord. When we are open, we can hear your voice. When we are open, we can feel your presence. When we are open, those words can change us. But we are a distracted people. We are the ones that walk the path as best as we can, but then we make a turn, not because of you, but because of us. We lose track. We get overwhelmed by the suffering that we have in our lives. And Lord, I just ask you to draw our attention again and again in whatever ways we need it so that we can be open to you. We humbly approach you this morning, Lord, because we need your help. We need your reassurance that no matter how many times we turn a corner away from you, that all that we've read about and all that we've ever heard and all that we've ever known is not only present, it is eternally present. But the salvation is received by learning to forgive and learning to repent and learning to love as Christ loved us. That we can see you better. We can know you more. And we may have the gift of sight where we can see you in the eyes of others. Forgive us for our imperfections, for our arrogance. We, need, we know we need more me time, Lord. So as we submit to you, let us continue to practice our faith through prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I've heard it all my life, even have it memorized, but it was only words to me, red letters on a page, just something people say, till it brought me to my knees, those words were just 360. Forgive me even then Who would pay that kind of price I've seen what mercy does He found me where I was And he gave his life for mine For God so loved the world he gave Gave his only son away Away to save Cover every stain, stain 
Amen. All right. Well, that's a way to kick off a new sermon series right there. Uh, we will be, we are starting today a series on the, the Gospel of Luke. Um, and, and we'll be spending 11 weeks in Luke, which might sound like a lot to you, but I assure you it is not. Uh, Luke is 24 chapters long, and if you take a, a, at all the words, I think it's only matched by Matthew's gospel. Uh, some of you are, are aware of how long it is, because you know anytime we begin a new series on a book of the Bible, that I always ask you to read that book of the Bible in one sitting um, to gain a perspective on it before we actually dive and, and kind of break down different sections and look at individual verses of the, the book itself. So I'm going to ask you to do the same thing for Luke. I realize it was a lot easier with the last series, which was Philippians, and it was only four chapters. So I, I told you it would take you 20 minutes even with your kids interrupting you, and uh, that is not the case with Luke's gospel. Uh, so if you take me up on my challenge and dare to read all of Luke's gospel in one sitting, uh, it will probably take you well over two hours. But let me tell you, it's two hours that are worth your time. Uh, because the things that you see in doing that are, are things that cannot be seen when we spend 11 weeks breaking down the story. And, and if you want to get the most out of reading Luke's gospel, it's going to be when you sit down and make that effort. I know it's a lot. Um, I'm not going to grade you. You don't have to turn anything in, all right? But this is just for your own well-being. And I think what comes out of it is a greater perspective on, on who Jesus is. And is there any bigger gift than that, right? Um, so we'll be spending 11 weeks in Luke's gospel. And um, given that we're really not spending that long on it, um, we're only today for the week one going to spend time on the first four verses. Luke's introduction. So 11 weeks to cover 24 chapters, and we're going to start with four verses. Yeah, um, that you heard that right. Uh, which tells us that these four verses are really important. And, and this is Luke's introduction to his gospel. And the reason we're going to spend one week, one of the 11 weeks, on just the first four verses is that what Luke tells us in these first four verses gives us insight in how we read the gospel itself. In fact, in this, Luke is going to tell you why he wrote his gospel and what he hopes you gain from it. Here's one of the beautiful things about Luke, uh, Luke's gospel, is that Luke actually wrote this for us. Um, it's addressed here in verse 3 to a man named Theophilus, who we believe was a rich man. He was probably someone who had a lot of social capital uh, and financial capital to make sure that this record of Jesus' story could get into as many hands as possible, including yours and mine. But Luke is really writing it to you and to me. He hopes that we will read this story. And he has hopes for us when we do. And to find out what that is, we're going to cheat a little bit. We're going to look at verse 4 before we even go into verse 1. So you're, we're cheating in church. That's, that's right. So uh, verse, verse 4. Luke says, I write these things so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. I write this so that you... Not just you, Theophilus, but you, reading the gospel, may have certainty of the things that you have been taught about Jesus. I don't know about you, but that word certainty sure stands out, doesn't it? Certainty in your belief. That word really stands out if you've ever been through a season of wrestling with doubts about what you believe about the story and who Jesus is. You know, dealing with the struggles of faith is a part of the faith journey. And I'm willing to bet most of us have, if not all of us, hopefully have been through some seasons like that where what we believe is, is tested. And, and we see this here. And, and I remember one of my seasons of, of doubt and when they came to be. Uh, actually came when I was... Um, starting my journey to be ordained as a pastor, ironically. 
Um, I had a meeting with who was the, he had just become the pastor of my home church and had heard that I had just started the process and, of ordination. And so he said, I want to meet you. And so I went and sat in his office and we had an hour's worth of great conversation, getting to know one another and life and um, a sense of call. And towards the end of the meeting, he got really serious. And he leaned over his desk toward me. And he said, young man, do you really know what you're getting yourself into? <laughs> Which is quite a question to ask an 18-year-old. Like, what 18-year-old knows what they're getting themselves into, let alone one that wants to become a pastor, right? And, and I kind of looked at him, and he said, what I'm asking you is, do you believe this? You know, you've committed to spend your entire life standing before a group of people to teach the teachings of Jesus, to stand on the story of Jesus. Do you believe this? Do you believe this enough to stake your life and your time and your energy on this message? And man, I was stunned, stunned. And, and I reacted in the way you think an 18-year-old would. Yes, 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 I believe it. I do. I believe this enough to get into whatever you say I'm getting myself into. And, and I projected that kind of confidence. But, but the reality was when I walked out of that room, like that question, like it just hung over me and it stayed with me. And truth be told, I may have tried to project confidence in that room, which I'm not sure I was very convincing. But, but inside, like I became very uncertain about what it was I believed and whether or not like I would stake my life in the work of my life upon doing this very thing. And what that question prompted was a several weeks long journey of wrestling with my faith, the most intense season of, of dealing with doubts and struggle, uh, of wrestling with what I believed about Jesus and what I believed about the scriptures. And, and I bring that up to you because I want to take you on a little bit of that journey. And I want to take you on that journey because Luke addresses some of the very things that I wrestle with in that season of dealing with my doubts. Luke looks at those of us in those seasons, and he writes his introduction in a way to say, I want you to be certain as you move into the story of Jesus, that this is the Jesus who walked among us. You know, the word certainty that, that we find here in verse 4 it actually comes from the word stability. And in this context, it means an undoubted truth. What Luke wants to do for us in just the first four verses here is he wants to remove any doubt, to remove anything from you that would or might be an obstacle to you encountering the Jesus that so changed his life. And so let's see what he has to say to us. In verse 1, Luke begins this way. He says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So Luke is very clear that he is not the only person who has taken up the time to write down the story of Jesus. We know by the time Luke's gospel has been written, we know that Mark's gospel has already been written, um, potentially Matthew's gospel even before Luke's, and John's is still uh, some years out. But we know that the story has already been researched and, and written down. So Luke is not the first. But clearly Luke has a message and a way of seeing and encountering Jesus in parts of the story of Jesus that the others did not or have not yet addressed. And, and the way that this story comes and the way the scriptures, the gospels, 
really came about for us was that in the beginning, after Jesus' resurrection and ascension to be with the Father, we know that there were 12 apostles that left in the beginning of the book of Acts. Uh, they acquired one after having lost Judas as one of the disciples. They became the apostles armed with the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. And the apostles went to churches in Jerusalem and eventually all around teaching the teachings of Jesus, telling the story of Jesus' life. And for years, it went on that way. And it wasn't until some of the apostles began to be martyred that the church began to realize we need to make an effort to record this story, that we might have something that's preserved to hand down to the future generations. And that's what they began to do a couple decades after Jesus' resurrection recording the teachings of the apostles, knowing they won't be there forever, especially when they began to die. And, and this is what Luke alludes to here when he talks about what's handed down. Uh, and, and we see that this is actually, this idea of handed down is actually a, a technical term. It's not just a, a way of saying it. It's actually a practice that was, was a part of the first century. The, the handing down took place, he, he's speaking to here, of, of students who would find themselves under a rabbi or a teacher. Part of the responsibility of being a student of a rabbi in the Jewish sense was that you were under their teaching, and, and part of what you were to do was to record and pass down an accurate understanding of the teacher's teachings and life. In fact, one of the central roles of a disciple was to accurately record the things the teacher laid before them. Because any time a rabbi gained the significance of having disciples, there was a hope that there would be continuity beyond the disciples. I mean, if you think about it, a disciple comes along to learn from, from a disciple of a teacher how to live their life. And so what would happen around these rabbis, well, they would establish schools of thought, a school around a vision of a way of being and a way of living. And so the disciples would record and begin to share these teachings so that they could eventually themselves pass them down to the next generation of people who wanted to bring themselves under that school of thought and that vision for their way of living. And Luke said, we're doing the same thing as those who've come under the school of Jesus, who believe in him and who he was and what he taught, to come under his way of living and vision for the world, we're handing these things down to you. And one of the fundamental things that must take place if there is to be continuity in the teachings and, and the story of the life is that there has to be accuracy. Without accuracy of the story, without accuracy of the teachings, there is no continuity. And so Luke says, when we handed them down, we handed down accurately the witness of Jesus' life in the teachings that he laid before us. And he tells us here what they've handed down. In fact, he says we've We've handed down an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. An account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. And so it leads the question to us, what, what is it that Luke is saying has been fulfilled among us? What has been accomplished that, that Luke is really speaking to here? And, and the short answer is, I, say, I know when I say short answer that you know a long answer will accompany. So if you're going to fall asleep in the long answer, go ahead and listen to this one. All right. Uh, the, the things that Luke is saying has been fulfilled among us. It's the hopes of the people of creation for redemption. That's the short answer. The hopes of creation for redemption and restoration. The long answer. The long answer starts in Genesis, the very beginning. 
In the very beginning of the creation narrative, we know that, that humanity was a part of God's desire to be in fellowship and that God created us for a life with him and not only to share in life and relationship with him, but to be in partnership with him. That in the beginning, you and I were, were created with an intended purpose to work alongside God in the care for, for his creation and his world. And there's this beautiful vision that Genesis 1 and 2 gives us of what life and fellowship, unbroken fellowship with the Father looks like. And we see uh, from, from the account of Scripture that this life with the Father, that He was our very source of life and being. And yet we see how quickly that falls apart in Genesis 3. How everything goes awry in the garden. And we see the central temptation that the enemy holds before Adam and Eve is, is that they would, would believe that this knowledge of good and evil, if they possessed it, they might be like God or even greater. Like the idea of the garden is that you and I might possess something that means we wouldn't need God to be Lord over our lives. That if we just gain this, we could truly be free. And that's the same temptation that grips creation today. I mean, you think about it, right? With all we see around us, the 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 call of our culture, right, is that there's a way of being in this life that you can discover where you don't need anyone to be Lord of your life. You get the freedom to be Lord of your own life, and you can fashion a life of satisfaction and significance. All this time later, and we're still taking the enemy's bait, right? And we see in Genesis 3, as soon as they take the bait, the disruption of the life that we once knew with the Father. Where there was once harmony and unity, both with the Father and with one another, there is now discord. And we see that very quickly that humanity and all of creation, in fact, begins to, to reel under the weight of our brokenness and sin. In fact, the Apostle Paul, the way he describes the state of humanity, the state of all creation, he says creation, in, in Romans 8, he says, is groaning as in the pains of childbirth. That's the way he describes the state of creation, groaning as in the pains of childbirth. Now, that's a vivid image, especially if you've given birth to a child. Yeah, and now I'm not about to be the dummy who stands up here and acts like I know what it's like to give birth to a child. I do not, and, but I have been close enough to know one thing, that it hurts. <laughs> yeah, even when you take the good stuff, right, it hurts. There's nothing that we have to keep it from hurting. It hurts, and that's part of why Paul uses this image to describe creation, what Paul's saying is that your childbirth, it's an internal pain in your body that is so intense that it forces you to groan. There's the kind of pain you can have in your life that, that hurts you and that you can grit your teeth and move on. And then there's the kind of pain that you cannot hold in. And childbirth is one of those pains you cannot hold hold in. It is so intense that it forces you to groan. It forces you to shout. And Paul is saying to us, he says, everything you see around you, all the brokenness, all the pain, all the anger, all the vitriol you see in the world, that is the external groaning of the inward pain of all of creation. Do you see it? Like Paul's saying, the brokenness that we feel is an internal brokenness due to sin and rebellion against the Father and the Father's desires. And so the things that we see, those are just the symptoms and signs of the inner turmoil and brokenness 
that we all share. And this is a state of creation. There's a brokenness that all of creation holds in common that leads to all the sins that we see and the brokenness in our world. That's just the external stuff that points to a much deeper internal issue. And what accompanies this, this brokenness is actually a desire for what is broken to be made whole. Ever since the garden, there has been a desire for humanity, for God to intervene, to bring redemption and restoration, to undo the very curse that we brought upon ourselves. And Luke, very beginning of his gospel, in chapter 1, not all that many verses from these, will tell us that those hopes of creation, to have one who comes who would mend what is broken, who would heal and make whole that which has been severed, has come to us in Jesus Christ. The first proclamation we have of this comes in Luke chapter 1 from Zechariah, the father of John the baptizer. After John is born to us, Zechariah gives a prophecy and, and he goes to the people. And, and what he says is he says this, he says, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation, a strong king to save us, is what he's saying. What Luke wants to hold in front of us is the one who fulfills our shared longing to be made whole and to be made new. It's Jesus who's come. This is the message, the central message of Luke's gospel is that salvation is found in Christ. You can boil 24 chapters down to just a sentence. I'm not trying to save you the two hours, okay? <laughs> but I want you to see it, right? Salvation is found in Christ. Luke says, man, our hopes have been fulfilled. And he says, I want you to know it. I want you to be certain. In verse 3, he tells us this, With this in mind, that all our hopes have been fulfilled, since I have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Luke says, I've carefully investigated. Uh, what we know from, from Luke's gospel um, is that Luke was not uh, a disciple of Jesus. Um, he did not walk with Jesus. We know this by the way that Luke writes. He doesn't write as though he is included in Jesus' story. Um, but he also wrote the book of Acts. And when you read the book of Acts, you find that, that Luke writes that from a very different perspective. So it's, it's realistic that Luke was an early convert, perhaps at Pentecost, or shortly after, but he was a player in the early church. Uh, we know this because Luke's name is mentioned in the gospel, uh, excuse me, the book of Acts, uh, as someone who traveled with Paul on one of his missionary journeys. And what happened on this missionary journey was that, was that Luke spent two years in Judea, two years in the place where all of those who were eyewitnesses to Jesus, where the apostles hold up, Luke spent two years in ministry there, which gave him access to the very people who sat in circles with Jesus, who followed him to hear him teaching on the hillsides. In that time, we believe Luke was able to gather and run through and investigate and pour over the details of Jesus' life and teachings with those who were there to see him and walk with him those who had 
unfettered access as his disciples and now apostles. And Luke says, I've run this story by all of them so that you can trust the accuracy of the story that I hold before you, the reliability of the story. And that's an important thing for us to realize because for me in my season of wrestling with doubts, one of the big questions I had was about the reliability of the story of the Gospels and also just Scripture itself. Those were big questions that I had. Uh, one of the objections that people make to, to this, knowing that for at least 20 years, um, Jesus' story was reliant upon oral tradition of the apostles and the eyewitnesses to tell the story of Jesus' life and to also give his teachings. Uh, one of the big objections that people give is what we think of as a telephone game, right? That we're not very good at oral tradition. We're not very good at keeping consistent when it comes to sharing something if we don't write it down. And you know the telephone game, right? The game you play as kids when you sit in a circle or a line and the first person has a word or phrase that they have in mind and, and, and you get really excited because it's a lot of fun to play the game and so you whisper really quickly and softly to the person next to you because you don't want the person next to them to hear what you're saying. Only the person next to you doesn't hear you very well and you can't repeat it so they just end up saying something that's different and then by the time it gets to the very end, it's nothing, right? Like what was said in the very beginning. We know the game, right? We played it. It's lots of fun. And we imagine that this was like that, like the apostles got up and shared teachings and what they ended up with some 20, 30 years after Jesus was resurrected that was completely different potentially than what um, they actually came, what, what actually took place. Um, and, and one of the books that helped me kind of work through this question, maybe you've had the same question yourself, um, was A Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. Maybe you've read the book before. It's a good read if you have questions about uh, the reliability of Scripture. And one of the chapters, as Dr. Craig Blomberg brings up a great point, he says, you don't realize, like, even when these Gospels, though they were written maybe 30, 40 years after Jesus, some of them are written after Jesus' resurrection, he said, you have to realize there were many, many eyewitnesses still alive. People who would either corroborate the story or bring out the inconsistencies within the teachings and story. He said, if you want to play the telephone game, if you want to use that analogy to understand the actual practices they used in the first century, he said, here's what this analogy would look like. He said, if you have the story from the first person that gets shared to the next person, he said, it would be like the third person turning around and saying to the first person, here's what I heard, is that right? And if they said it isn't right, then he said, then they would make the correction. And so it went down the line. He said the stories as they're being written down are written in a communities. They're born out of communities of people who walked with Jesus and heard Jesus. They're not isolated to individuals that are further isolated from other communities where there's no accountability. These emerge from communities of accountability who felt it was their chief role to hand you an accurate story of Jesus' life and teachings. And if the intention isn't enough, or the science isn't enough, to convince you, then maybe the facts are. If you're wondering about the reliability of the New Testament, we'll just take the New Testament here. We know that we have more manuscripts in the New Testament than we have of any other religious or even just ancient documents. In fact, the number two of, of text we have is Homer's Iliad. If you've, I took an an English, uh, old, old English, English course, British history, writings, and boy, I tell you what, man, suffering through that thing was, was a chore. Uh, but you take Homer's Iliad, we have 650 copies over time of that. Um, and that's number two. In the New Testament, there are over 6,000 manuscripts or fragments of books from the New Testament. 
6,000. Written over different periods of years in different places. And when you hold these together and you look at these, the accuracy and consistency is astounding. And that's not even, not even taking into account the other 24,000 fragments that were taken from the Greek and translated and placed in different countries. If you were to take those that were written some years later and look at those and hold them to the original Greek, you will find staggering consistency. So much so that Blomberg says, man, if this wasn't the Bible that some scientists looked at with contention, he said, this, would, this is the most remarkable document you could ever find because nothing matches this kind of consistency over time and space like the scriptures. And I bring this up because I, I know Luke wants you when you encounter this story to do so in a way where there's nothing, no obstacles blocking your reception of seeing Jesus for who he is. That there's no doubts that might keep you from, from truly putting all your hope and your trust in Jesus. That he is who the gospel claims he is. That he did the things that Luke tells us that he did. Luke says, I'm writing because I want to give you the gift of certainty about the story of Jesus. And those are strong words because we know we are here on the basis of faith, aren't we? We're here because ultimately we trust. We trust that Luke, who was motivated by the Jesus that he loved, who carefully investigated, who wants us to know certainty, that, that he's trustworthy, that the accounts we have get accurate, picture of who Jesus is and what he believed and what he taught to us. But Luke says, man, I want you to be certain. You may go through seasons of doubt in your life, but I don't want those doubts to linger or plague you. I want you to have the gift of seeing who Jesus is, of knowing who he is, and being changed by him like I've been changed by him. And that's my hope for you. Whether you pick Luke up and read it in two hours or whether you wait the 11 weeks or do both, hopefully, that our eyes are open to who Jesus is, that we can put our whole trust in him and find in him the life that is truly life and walk in it all our days. We're going to bow in a word of prayer together. If you pray with me. Jesus, you made yourself known to us. You came to us as one of us to heal and mend that which was broken in us, to redeem us from sin by the gift of your life for us, by dying your, our death, and you being raised to life as the keeper and Lord of life. You gift us a wonderful life in you by which we can trust and put our hope and faith and walk with you to know your love and claim upon our souls. Would you free us to that life? Any who are plagued by doubt, finding themselves in seasons with questions, may you, through the study of the Gospel of Luke, may you open their eyes. May you help them to see. May you help them discover what is the greatest gift anyone might know in you. For that is our prayer. Amen. I'm inviting you to stand and let's sing together.
Frank Wellen, thank you for being with us today. We have a couple, well, more than just a couple announcements. We've hit that season where like every Sunday has got a lot coming up here pretty soon. Uh, so next week we have an incredible opportunity. If you have ever wanted to, to know how to read the scripture in a way that you understand it and find uh, more meaning in it, uh, we have an opportunity for you next Saturday. Dr. Dave Smith, who's a professor of New Testament up in Indiana Wesleyan University, is going to come and teach us on Saturday. Uh, that'll be from 9 to 3. There's a, a QR code to follow uh, on the screen. There'll also be a link in our newsletter if you want lunch. Uh, be sure to let us know you'll be there. And um, I believe lunch is $10, but he's going to come and share. Uh, what's great about Dave is he not only has a lot of knowledge, uh, but he has a, such a profound love for the Lord. Uh, that it just seeps through his teaching. So it is a gift to you to be there, if at all possible for you. Um, uh, next Saturday from 9 to 3, he'll preach for us that Sunday. But what he's also going to do, um, he's going to preach on Luke, uh, but he's also going to help us uh, understand how we can read through Luke. That's going to be part of his example on Saturday. So it'll be great for you as you are working through it. Um, I uh, want you to also grab our waypoints on the way out. We'll be looking through Luke's gospel uh, beginning now, so that'll be a help to you as you read through that. Um, also, uh, we have coming up the next Sunday, um, we'll be giving a presentation. I'll be giving my presentation on my trip to Africa on Zoe and Powers during the Sunday school hour. Uh, so I invite you to go in the Family Life Center over here, and we'll, I'll share on that and the opportunity that's in front of us as a church uh, to, to be a part and partner with that program. Uh, the next week after that, Saturday, is Lord's Acre. It's already on us. Uh, if you're not familiar with that term, that's our fall fest. And uh, we have good food. We have things to, uh, we'll have a live auction, silent auction, um, all the kinds of sweets you could even possibly imagine. So um, be sure to come and, and be a part of that. Uh, it's a great day for our church. And so if you have some things to give, Cheryl, raise your hand. Uh, is a person to come and hunt down and see. Uh, so be sure to do that. Uh, we also have, I forgot, coming up on the 29th, Pumpkins are coming because that's happening also. Uh, so uh, our pumpkin patch will be kicking off. So if you're looking for a good workout on Sat Sunday, lifting pumpkins, man, there's nothing better. So uh, come on over there. Uh, I think the Cowboys play at 3.30. So if we all show up after worship, uh, we'll eat pizza, we'll do pumpkins, and you'll be back in time, resting easy after the game. So um, please come and help us out with that. Lots of things going on. Be sure to keep your eye out for the newsletter. Uh, don't want you to miss any of them. Lots of great things. So um, thankful you're here. If you're a guest with us, uh, apologize for taking so long. You're invited to any of the stuff we mentioned. We'd love to have you there. Um, but, but thank you for coming. Um, let's go ahead and as we hear just our, our word of benediction. Uh, Luke wants to give us a gift of faith, of knowing, of trusting who this Jesus is. And my prayer is that our eyes and our hearts will be opened to know him more. Amen. Let's sing before we leave. Oh, victory.